Hello, my name is Nicole Nimmons. I am the Community Education and Outreach Coordinator for the YWCA Spokane. Thanks so much for hopping onto this video here today. So in the spirit of social distancing and being remote, I wanted just to bring to you a very brief video on Intimate Partner Violence since that is one of the programs that we do have at the YWCA Spokane and just kind of some ins and outs of Intimate Partner Violence. I did want to give you a quick heads up, however, that some of the things in this specific video that I do talk about may be a little bit triggering for you. So obviously take care of yourself in this process, but also we do have advocates available at 509-326-2255 or 509-326-CALL. Feel free to give us a call 24-7 and we'll always be there to help you in regards to um, helping you through your feelings on intimate partner violence or to get you services if needed. So. Let's just dive right into intimate partner violence, okay? And in order to talk about intimate partner violence, we need to put a definition to it, right? So what I, the definition that I give out in the community is a very specific definition. It's very simplistic, but I will say this is a definition that you're not going to see if you were to Google it or the legal definition that you might see in the court system. It's a very simplistic definition that I give, but it's on a very broad topic, okay? And we'll talk about all the intricacies of this topic as we go, okay? So intimate partner violence. The definition I'm going to give you right here is it's basically where one partner establishes and maintains power and control over another intimate partner. And that can be done in a variety of ways and that we'll talk about in a second. But I also wanted to clarify on top of that little definition that when we're talking about intimate partner violence, we're talking about husband, wife, girlfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend. We have to have that intimacy factor, okay? So those are the people that we see at the YWCA Spokane. Um, if it's coworkers, if it's dad to daughter, if it's siblings, if it's neighbors, cousins, if it's anybody else, um, there is other agencies within our community that can also help with those different pieces that are more our sister agencies, and we're happy to refer you to them as well. But for all intents and purposes, this is what the video is about, is intimate partner uh, violence, okay? So those are the people that we see at the YWCA in our intimate partner violence program. We also, though, however, see the youth and children that are um, exposed to the intimate partner violence within the household as well. So just so you know that too. Okay, so in order to really give you the, the whole picture of what is considered intimate partner violence, um, I need to be able to show you a diagram. So I'm going to switch over in just a moment here. But the reason that I like to show um, this diagram to show various ways that you can be um, considered a victim or survivor on intimate partner violence is because we oftentimes will have clients that call or come in and say, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be here. Maybe the services are best for somebody else or I don't want to take somebody else's spot. The reality is, you know, if you have in your gut instinct that this is not a healthy dynamic, odds are you probably are a victim or survivor of intimate partner violence. And I'll, I'll clarify in the various ways, but, you know, trust your gut. If you feel like this is unhealthy, that this is, this is not okay, that the relationship is more pretty much all one-sided, acknowledge that and, and know that, you know, you're worth these services. And if you want help, we're here to help you. And, uh, you know, even if somebody else's situation seems worse than yours, it doesn't mean your situation's not valid. Okay. So, um, I'm going to switch over here. Alrighty. So this right here, what you see is a power control wheel. It was developed in, excuse me, it developed in Duluth, Minnesota, um, over two decades ago. So we have adapted it over time. And this is the one that we see and use at the YWCA Spokane. Um, this wheel itself Basically, everything on it can be considered intimate partner violence. And I'm going to give you a brief example of each individual piece of the pie. But just to kind of go off of what I was saying earlier, don't feel like you need to meet one specific area, right? Or, or tons of definitions. One little tiny snippet of what I tell you in the next few minutes um, could be considered intimate partner violence, okay? So don't narrow yourself to having to prove that you are a victim or survivor. If you identify as such in any way, shape, or form, then we can help, okay? So let's just dive right in. So this, this, all the orange that you see there is different ways that you can be um, in an intimate partner violence situation, okay? And on the purple on the outside is that constant physical and sexual violence threat that could potentially happen. So those, that's always that constant looming thing over your head that something else could get really, really bad, okay? 
and these are obviously different techniques or, or tactics that per, uh, abusers will use against their victims. So let's just start on the very bottom there, isolation, okay, in that orange piece right underneath power control, isolation. So you meet somebody, you fall head, in, head over heels, you're in love, you're in lust, they're the bee's knees, um, you are have your own bubble, they have their own bubble, but you slowly start kind of doing only what they want to do, going with their friends, their family, um, their coworkers, doing what they want to do throughout the day, and, you know, you want to spend all your time with them because what do they say? Love is what? blind right so love is blind and, and you don't see what's actually happening but slowly the abuser is actually isolating you from your own personal bubble and giving you only what they see in their world or what they experience in their world you don't see this happening but odds are a lot of your co-workers your friends your family they will see this type of stuff happening and you won't listen to it you won't hear it because you Again, love is blind. You don't see what's actually happening around you, okay? This is also a pretty good size warning sign for a lot of people that something major is happening. Um, and it could even be one step further. Let's say let's uh, you move in with the abuser or your partner that you identify as a partner and you, you, know, you and your partner move out into a remote area and, you know, away from people, away from your friends, away from your family, move, maybe move across the country or into a different state. There's other bigger ways that also you can be isolated besides just getting you out of your bubble and into theirs, but they can actually physically uh, isolate you as well. Uh, moving upwards, let's do counterclockwise there for the fun of it. So emotional abuse, you know, you're fat, you're ugly, you'll never amount to anything, you know, putting you down, making them feel not good about themselves, playing mind games or making them feel guilty. And, you know, it could be also things like grabbing a hold of maybe your love handle, if you want to call it that, on your side and just kind of looking at it in a disgusted way, almost as if to say you're fat or you're ugly or you need to go lose weight, right? Um, those can be those type of pieces as well. And along with that, you know, maybe you shouldn't dress like that. Maybe you shouldn't look like that. You know, your dress is too tight or your suit is too loose or you look ugly, you know, just putting you down. Uh, moving up there to intimidation. So sharpening a knife in front of you, having a loaded gun on the table, constantly having different uh, threatening type of gestures towards you or maybe throwing something across the the, the um, area at the wall and breaking it. It could be destroying property or abusing the pets in the household or killing them and blaming you for it, which oftentimes will happen. Just giving you free, uh, different looks or actions that are makes you really scared, right? Coercion and threats, threatening to get you fired from work or your job, you know, planting drugs in your car, um, threatening to kill themselves if you were to leave, those type of pieces, which is, you know, obviously in that type of case, you know, there's something really wrong there, right? There's there's an unhealthy situation going on there is that really what that red flag kind of sh should be telling you, right? Uh, making the partner drop charges if there is a protection order in place or threats to out you. So let's say you are part of the LGBTQ plus community and your partner is threatening to out you, but you're not ready to come out yourself. And that could be enough to keep you, to, you know, make you stay, right? Immigration status. So, you know, especially with this current cl uh, climate that we are seeing ourselves in, you know, threatening to deport your partner back to the country that you had, uh, came from, threatening to keep your kids with you as the abuser, um, not filling out the paperwork correctly, or maybe getting ICE involved, threatening to have you again deported and not be able to see your kids again. Uh, intentionally withdrawing paperwork once it's been filed to jeopardize legal status or not allowing the partner to learn English, which is huge, right? And, and you, you know, you mix not learning English with isolation and you there's a whole big problem there, right? And on top of it, if that victim and or survivor doesn't know how to speak English and if they don't know if they can trust the legal system, they might not be able to come out and talk to people from various backgrounds, whether it's law enforcement or service agencies, about help. So it's definitely a, a big way to keep hold of somebody as a victim um, and with you being the abuser. Uh, cultural abuse, you know, just how it sounds, acceptance of, of in-law abuse or using cultural norms as a tool to limit physical movement, such as like justifying beatings or demanding subservience. Limiting roles of the partner to prevent them from working or preventing the possibility of marrying by accusing the partner of adultery, 
as a way to really impact their honor and or chastity that they might have. Spiritual abuse, it could be things like quoting different Bible verses and really manipulating those in a way to make it sound like that victim needs to do something or say something or act a certain way towards you to justify beating or limiting physical movement, um, coercing the partner to have sex by citing it to God-given right. Um, and sadly, a lot of times we tend to find this is further reinforced if they do go to a clergy member or non-progressive type of institution um, through marriage counseling, you know, because that's a lot of times what, we, what people end up suggesting. And marriage counseling is never a good idea when we're talking about um, intimate partner domestic violence, okay? Uh, economic abuse. It could be things like um, preventing the partner from getting or keeping a job, making partner ask for money or grovel for money or do things for money, blaming the partner for any financial gaps that they may have, or even taking away or limiting access to family income altogether. You know, the abuser basically runs all the ins and outs in regards to the finances, so they have very little uh, um, freedom in regards to that as a victim. And frankly, if they want to eventually leave, the odds of them being able to put money away is very much on the slim side, unless there's, you know, a danger that's involved with that. So that is also a piece of it as well. Dominance, you know, abusive privilege hierarchy, treating the partner like a servant or making them, you know, feel like they are only ones that can make decisions as the abusers. Um, acting like the master of the castle or the king of the castle or the queen of the castle, being the one that basically defines the, the roles in the household, what they do versus what their victim and or survivor will do. Children and reproduction. So it could be things like the kids uh, um, being used to, to go in between the abuser and the victim if it is something where the victim has now left in some way, um, using the children to relay messages between them and the victim or threatening to that they won't ever see their kids again to take away the kids or using the visitations to harass their partner continuously that's a huge piece of it as well and and making the partner feel guilty about the children or what kind of effects you're having on the kids um, by you leaving right that's a huge piece of it also um the victims a lot of times that they have left will purposely come back because they are don't want the increased abuse to happen on the kids and they would rather have it onto themselves. And also to touch on the reproduction side of things is purposely raping or manipulating birth control so that the perpetrator or abuser can get that victim and or um, survivor pregnant if we are assuming a heterosexual relationship where the victim in this case is female and the male is um, um, the abuser, getting them pregnant, raping them, and then once the actual pregnancy happens, a lot of times we tend to see that the physical abuse and the actual abuse itself, the, the domestic violence and or intimate partner violence, gets a lot worse on the victim and survivor ultimately um, for a variety of reasons um, that we can't go into right now, but it does tend to increase. And then lastly, minimizing, denying, and blaming. Another word for that would be um, gaslighting and basically making you feel like you're questioning your own sanity. You know, maybe my sense of reality is not actually what's happening. You know, they say, I think it's one thing, but they clearly I was, you know, I didn't understand it right, or it's not actually what is is what actually is happening, right? And so making you kind of question your own sanity ultimately. It's making light of the abuse and not taking their partner's con concerns about it seriously, denying the abuse ever happened in the first place, or even shifting the responsibility for the abuse altogether, and saying that the, the victims um, and or survivors actually caused it in the first place. That's a huge, huge, huge tactic that abusers will use to keep control over their victims and survivors. Um, and or their partners and ultimately have them either stay or go back in that relationship. So those are kind of really, really brief examples as to different pieces of how somebody can be abused in an intimate partner uh, violence situation. And again, everything in the purple on the outside is just different ways of physical and sexual violence that also can happen. That is that constant looming threat um, on the victim and or survivor. So anything in that wheel is considered, like I said, any kind of, you know, way that you can abuse another partner. And so if you feel that you identify in anywhere, shape or form in that, that wheel I just kind of briefly described to you, please feel free that you can give us a call. Or if you know of somebody that's going through it and, and that kind of help clarify some things for you, definitely, you know, feel free to reach out if, if that's something that you do need. 
Um, and ultimately, if you or someone you, you love or is concerned about intimate partner violence, again, I'm going to give you that number, uh, YWCA uh, Spokane's 24-hour helpline number, 509-326-2255 or 509-326-CALL. We can definitely always help you in regards to, again, getting services for you, being there to process things with you, or you can also email us if it's safer or if it's a more convenient way to do it. It's help at ywcaspokane.org as well is another way to get a hold of us and we'll make sure um, to get you to the right people. We do, for all intents and purposes, serve women, men, non-binary, and the LGBTQ community. So again, as long as you identify as a victim or survivor of intimate partner violence, whether it's currently or in the past, we can help you through that completely free and confidential. So I do want to encourage you, check out the rest of the, my coworkers and fellow advocates' videos. Learn as much as you can. Ask any questions that you have. Um, there will be some frequently asked questions and some awesome resources on the page. Check it out. And uh, hopefully um, you have learned a little bit today, um, ultimately. And thank you so much for, for stopping in. Bye.